Welcome back to Known Unknowns Watergate. This is part five of the eight part series. I'm Hugh Hewitt, the president of the Richard Nixon Foundation coming to you from the Nixon Library in Yorba Linda. Behind me you see a picture of Richard Nixon's birthplace which is part of the library grounds. I hope you'll visit us in Yorba Linda. To my right is Jeff Shepard, longtime Watergate expert because he comes from the Nixon White House legal defense team having served in the White House for much of the Nixon administration, having been a White House fellow, then joining the Department of Treasury, then going over to the White House on the Domestic Policy Council, eventually transitioning over, as his Harvard Law degree would allow him to do, to the President's Legal Defense Team. And we'll get to that eventually. But when we left off at the end of part four of Known Unknowns, Watergate, we we're talking about then Attorney General, then back to the Committee to Reelect the President, Chairman John Mitchell, and Jeff Shepard. Jeff Mitchell was the subject of a very interesting book by Mr. Rosen. Yes. Uh, and it's a very good book. Uh, but not a lot of people know him. Would you explain a little bit for audience the character of, of John Mitchell and how Martha Mitchell enters into the Watergate drama? Sure. Uh, we talked a little bit before about John Mitchell being a senior partner in Nixon's uh, law firm in, uh, in New York, Nixon Mudge Rose. Uh, and John was a bond lawyer and responsible for inventing the moral obligation bond. A powerful man and highly respected by President Nixon. Uh, he didn't want to come to Washington. He ran the Nixon campaign in 1968. Uh, uh, but he didn't want to come to Washington. He really wasn't that political. Uh, but they begged him to come and, and he accepted the position as Attorney General. A lot of the career people at the Department of Justice will tell you he was the best attorney general they'd ever ever served under. Uh, very, very serious, very straightforward. Uh, uh, Henry Peterson, the head of the criminal division, told me he didn't think that uh, John Mitchell ever said one word over what he intended to say. I mean, he was just uh, uh, very astute, very much in charge. His wife was a real handful. Uh, it was a second marriage. Uh, uh, she was on her way to becoming a raging alcoholic, uh, and, and she was trouble. And what happened as, as things after the Watergate break-in progressed, Watergate break-in when the arrests occurred was June 17, 1971. 1972. 1972. Uh, uh, and what Martha would do was to listen in on phone calls in the evening that her husband took in their apartment at the Watergate hotel or, or apartment complex and then, uh, as she continued to consume alcohol, she would call uh, reporters, uh, notably Helen Thomas and others, and, and complain about how Washington was being cruel to her husband. Uh, very loyal to her husband, but in, in her alcoholic stupor, she would say things that were just terrible uh, and were causing a lot of trouble. So, uh, By causing a lot of trouble, were they leading investigators to the truth, or were they simply... Uh, throwing Molotov cocktails in an already tinder-laden uh, Washington, D.C. The latter. Uh, she didn't know anything. John didn't know very much. It was just there was, there was talk and people were touching base with him. Uh, remember, the, the arrests occur on June 17th, and he resigns on July 1st, uh, 1972, uh, as head of the Nixon re-election campaign. We all thought at the time... He resigned as Attorney General in July. No, no, no. He resigned as Attorney General on March 1st, uh, uh, 1972, to come take over the campaign. He then resigned from the campaign on July 1st, just a few months later, uh, and we thought it was to care for his wife. There were... Lots of sympathetic articles saying, you know, what a guy. He's giving up politics, going back to New York because she is such a handful. So he actually transitions back to New York and back oh, to the private leaves, practice leaves of the law. Oh, absolutely. Leaves the city. Leaves the city. And amazingly, there is no record of him speaking with or meeting with President Nixon until March 22, 1973. So he disappears from the, uh, the Washington scene and Watergate, direct connection with Nixon, for nine or ten months. In the meantime, the burglars, including Howard Hunt and James McCord and the Cubans, 
have been put on trial, they have been found guilty, it is time for the sentencing. As a part of that, as you recall in previous episodes, the United States Senate had convened a Watergate special inquiry panel that was chaired by Sam Urban, ranking minority member Howard Baker. They were running up to their summer long series of hearings. What happened to the defendants in the burglary at, at the conclusion of their sentencing? Well, let me take one step back because I was warming up to this. The, the, the public is led to believe John is leaving to care for his wife. But on the tapes, and remember I transcribed the tapes, and, and uh, you had to find the conversation that was being subpoenaed, so frequently you would run into other conversations. And there's a conversation where President Nixon is talking to Bob Haldeman, and he says roughly, did you ask him if he was involved? What, year, what month, day? Oh, this is uh, before, this is after June 17th and, and, and in the two and a half week period before John resigns. And he says, he's, uh, Nixon says to Haldeman, did, did you talk to him about it? And Haldeman says, well, you know, you can't come right out and ask him if, if he's involved. So what I said, this is Haldeman, what I said to Mitchell is, you know, if stuff is likely to come out that would prove to be very embarrassing, it might be better for you to have left now before that emerges. And then we know that on July 1st, he announced his resignation and so, left. So there was suspicion in the White House between the president and Bob Haldeman that maybe Creep was involved? Well, there was no question Creep was involved. That, that was open and shut. The question was how high up did it go within Creep? Uh, uh, you, you know, James McCord was head of security at Creep. Uh, uh, he, was, he was caught red-handed as one of the burglars. Uh, uh, Gordon Liddy was fired from Creep shortly thereafter for refusing to respond to FBI questions. Uh, uh, Liddy had told John Dean that they were his people. John Dean had told Ehrlichman, uh, I assume, he, that that went to, to Haldeman. The issue was, was Gordon Liddy off on a toot of his own, or was this a campaign effort? And higher-ups above Gordon Liddy within the campaign knew what was going on. That was the immediate issue. But the other question that arises 50 years after the fact, was there an obligation on Dean, Ehrlichman, Haldeman if he was told, or the president if he was told, that it was my people, according to Gordon Liddy, to step forward and tell anyone? Well, yes and no, Hugh. Uh, there's only one uh, connection between Nixon and the then Attorney General Dick Kleindienst, and Dick Kleindienst describes it in his book called Justice, and he said, the only communication I had directly with the president was he told me he expected a thorough and vigorous investigation. That's it. Uh, and similarly with Pat Gray, the acting director of the FBI, in his book, In Nixon's Web, which was not a complimentary book, he says, I had one direct conversation with Nixon. I warned him. I feared his people were inadvertently causing him trouble because they were getting involved, he meant John Dean, in the investigation. And Nixon said, Pat, you follow your job just like you're supposed to. And that was the only communication I ever had with Dick Nixon. So what you have is a president whose plate is full, foreign affairs, domestic affairs, everything else going on, who has a Department of Justice, an attorney general run by Dick Kleindienst and an FBI run by Pat Gray, and he told each of them in no uncertain terms he expected them to do a thorough and complete investigation. If it's already being investigated, if there's full-time people, Earl Silbert and his team at the U.S. Attorney's Office, running a grand jury, running an investigation, what further obligation do you owe them? When we now look back at 50 years, we know that Deep Throat was a deputy to Pat Gray. When yes. that revelation occurred, were you surprised? Uh, when he came out in uh, 2005 or 2006 as Deep Throat? No. I tell was us not about surprised. that individual and what their role was and what they knew and what they could tell Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. Well, uh, uh, there's two people at the FBI. Uh, as 
uh, J. Edgar Hoover is aging and has stayed too long, and they're competing to replace him. So if there's an internal promotion, uh, it will be either Mark Felt, who's a deputy uh, director of the FBI, or another gentleman uh, whose name escapes me for the moment, uh, Bill Sullivan, okay? And both are career bureaucrats negotiating, and Sullivan befriends the White House and is kind of their, their friend. Mark Felt uh, doesn't. But what Mark did, apparently, is set out to show that Pat Gray was not able to run the FBI, that he was inept, and well, he was only acting director, and what, what he was trying to convey to the White House indirectly was you need a FBI insider to run this agency. This agency uh, needs careful control. Was and, he trying to do that through Woodward and Bernstein? Yes, he was leaking material from the FBI's investigation of Watergate, not to sink Nixon, he was ho kept hoping for an appointment, but to sink Pat Gray. And, and there's the a wonderful book, there's a wonderful book uh, by Max Holland called Why Mark Felt Became Deep Throat. We can come back to that, but the information he was leaking, when did those leaks occur? In this period of time during the investigation up to conviction or after conviction of the burglars before their sentencing or after their sentencing? Oh, uh, uh, we have to rely on Woodward and Bernstein for when they first had this relationship, but in their books, uh, they indicate it started within the first week of uh, uh, after the break-in arrests that they started getting information from this guy that Woodward knew. And it, it, it was, it was the, the background for the many, many, many articles they wrote and were published in the Washington Post, roughly half of which turned out to be inaccurate. The word, the, 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 the name Deep Throat never appeared in their work. They had a source. They wouldn't tell others within the uh, Washington Post newsroom, notably Ben Bradley, who the source was, but they said they had a source. Then when they went to write their book, the publisher said, this isn't sexy enough. We need some more, uh, we need a grabber. And that's when they came up with the name Deep Throat. And over the years, many different people came under the cloud of suspicion <clears throat> of being Deep Throat. Were you ever suspected of being Deep Throat? No, fortunately I was not, but everyone around me was. What's so interesting, now, and I've studied this because this, this matters a great deal to me. When Woodward and Bernstein were doing their articles, they were approached by Robert, I'm, I'm told this, by Robert Redford who said, look, I want to do a movie about you guys. I don't want to do a movie about Watergate. So we can do the movie right away, but you've got to write a book so I can base the movie on the book. So they wrote the book, All the President's Men, knowing it was supposed to be made into a movie. In the book, they describe Deep Throat, but they were very, very straight. They never indicated Deep Throat worked at the Nixon White House. But when they went to make the movie, everything changed. And there's three uh, uh, blatant examples in the movie, not in the book. Uh, 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 Redford and uh, Dustin, Hoffman. Dustin Hoffman are on the steps of the uh, Library of Congress, and they've run out of leads. And, and uh, uh, he says, I've got a friend at the White House. And then they start getting more information. Another point in the movie, Redford is calling Deep Throat at his office. Don't ever call me at my office. He's in a phone booth, it's a fake phone booth, it's a phone booth outside Pennsylvania Avenue and he's looking up at the old EOB when he's talking to the guy on the phone. And then they've got that very, very famous scene where Hal Holbrook, who is Deep Throat, is leaving at night to meet with Woodward, and there's this shot from the floorboard up of, uh, uh, of Holbrook, you know, it's eerie, and he's leaving the northwest gate of the White House. Now, I've got to, I've got to remind our audience, I haven't seen this movie since it came out, and I doubt many of our audience have ever seen it. But yes. what you're conveying is that the movie took dramatic license to 
uh, insinuate that Deep Throat was a member of the White House staff? In no uncertain terms. I mean, insinuate is an understatement. And it, it, but that was not in and, all the presidents. Not in men. the book. It's not in the book. It's only in the movie, but everybody saw the movie. All right, so I want to go back to but, the... But, but let me... So every single person accused of being Deep Throat is a supposedly whistleblower on Nixon's White House staff who was so disgusted with the cover-up that he was leaking stuff to Woodward and Bernstein, which turns out to be patently untrue. What, what Deep Throat was doing was leaking material already known to the government to two reporters. The public didn't know, but Earl Silbert, who led the investigation, has said he didn't learn a single thing from any of Woodward and Bernstein's columns because they were leaking what the government already knew and was investigating. It, whether you call that fake news or not, the American public was misled. And, and what's going on is the American public is led to believe there's all these people at the, at the Nixon White House that, that, that are evil. I, I, I insist on the, on the distinction. They were in the campaign. The Nixon re-election campaign was what was, had, had uh, the intelligence plan and, and, and involved in the break-in. No one on the White House staff has ever been shown to have known of the break-in in advance except John Dean. But he denies having known it in advance. He doesn't deny having known about the campaign intelligence plan. He recruited and hired Gordon Liddy. He went to the two meetings in the attorney general's office where that plan was discussed. But he denies knowing about... He denies knowing the specific intended break-in into the That's DNC. That's what I want to get. Now, I want to go back to people are still... We've got burglars. It ought not to have happened. It came from creep. Uh, it goes into conviction mode. They are convicted. They are awaiting sentencing. This is in the spring of 1973. Richard Nixon has been reelected in an overwhelming landslide. Yes. How does it spiral out of control? You have a Senate committee, which can't do much damage. Right. And right. you've got a, to a sitting president who is not implicated in ordering the breakout, break in. And you've got uh, seven individuals who've been convicted in awaiting sentencing. How does that metastasize into okay. a series of events that over the course of 18 months will cause Richard Nixon to resign? Uh, th this is complex, but you, you're right at the key because they've been convicted. Sentencing is two months later. Convicted on January 30th. Sentencing is March 23rd, 1973. Irvin Committee's founded in February, but it's gearing up. It's not doing anything. And then you hit sentencing week. And I'm going to show you on my hand because it gets very, very complex. This is Monday, the 19th of March. This is Friday, the 23rd, which is sentencing day. The defendants are looking at long prison terms. Hunt says on the Friday before, I need more money. I got outstanding legal bills. Stuff, are, I'm going to talk about seamy stuff I've done for the White House. That word gets to John Dean on Monday morning. He calls Ehrlichman. Ehrlichman says, not my problem, call John Mitchell. Because remember, as we talked before, the White House people were not knowledgeable about the planned break-in uh, and, and, and are, are apart. The people at Creep are in real trouble. And they've been running the cover-up because they're in real trouble. It's better for your viewers to appreciate what happened if they picture John Dean as working for Creep. Now, the White House thinks he's protecting their interests. Creep has got real troubles, but worst case, it's not the White House. But John is the poison line. He goes over, because he's worried about being prosecuted himself, because he, hi he recruited and hired Liddy. He was at those key meetings in the Attorney General's office. So he casts his lot with them. Then comes the final week. Monday morning, he learns that Hunt wants 120,000 bucks, 75,000 legal fees, 50,000 walking around money. It doesn't quite add, but it's, the numbers are real close. Uh, he tells Ehrlichman, Ehrlichman says, call Mitchell. Apparently, he tells Mitchell. Then on Tuesday, uh, Wednesday morning, we're now midweek, this is the key day, he tells Fred LaRue that Hunt wants 120,000. And where is Fred LaRue at this Fred point? Fred LaRue is a uh, assistant that Mitchell brought with him to Creep. We talked about who's that. Who's been intimately involved in the cover-up. And he's the paymaster. He's the so one. So the committee to re-elect is still operating. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, uh, no, 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 Nixon's been reelected, uh, uh, but but it hasn't closed up. It ha the but committee still, still, still exists. have money. They still have money. They don't have enough money, but they still have money. And and Fred says, I got the money. I have enough to pay him off. It'll it'll end the till, but I'm not paying without somebody telling me. And Dean says, I'm out of the payment business. You'll have to find somebody else. Now they've already paid three hundred and fifty thousand of legal bills and humanitarian aid. This is Hunt wanting more. Dean says, and they've all sworn to this. This is uncontroverted. Dean says, if I were you, I'd call Mitchell. Okay. Dean then. This is Wednesday morning. Okay. Dean then goes into a meeting with the president at ten thirty. The date being March twenty first, nineteen seventy three. And this is called the cancer on the presidency meeting. He goes in and says, you know, Mr. President, that things haven't been going well. Uh, there's an awful lot of pressure. Uh, uh, you're going to have to make some decisions, uh, really serious decisions. And you don't know what's been going on, but we are being blackmailed by Howard Hunt. And uh, other people have committed perjury and made false representations during the course of this investigation. And it's about to blow. And then he spends an hour and a half with President Nixon, and we have the tape, talking about what on earth they should do. Should they pay Hunt? Should they buy time to get their act together? Should they say, no, this is never going to work uh, uh, because over time it, it might cost a million dollars? And the tape's an hour and a half, but there's no decision made at that meeting. Haldeman joins for the last half hour. And the only decision, because we have the tape, is let's get Mitchell down from New York and decide what to do. So right after that meeting, Haldeman calls Mitchell. Mitchell can't come down until the next day. At 5 o'clock that evening, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Dean, and Nixon gather to prepare for the meeting on Thursday when Mitchell will come. And while it's not perfectly clear in that meeting, they all believe that Mitchell's guilty as hell. And if the president calls for a new investigation, which is becoming the answer, it's like asking John Mitchell to walk the plank. Then, and this is what's amazing, is they discover substantially later that at 10 o'clock that night, Wednesday night, March 21st, $75,000 is paid to Howard Hunt's lawyer. Okay, so there's a payoff. Now, look at it from a special prosecutor's point of view just for a second. Nixon learns at a meeting that ends at noon, at 10 o'clock that night, Fred LaRue arranges for the payment to Howard Hunt. Nixon must have been involved. Okay, now, what has to have happened in that 10 hour window is after the tape stopped, Nixon has to have told Haldeman, tell Mitchell to pay that guy. Haldeman calls Mitchell. That's record it's not recorded, but we know there's a phone call. They say it was to invite Mitchell to come down to the meeting. The prosecutors say, yeah, well, you don't believe them. He was telling Mitchell, pay the guy. F to complete the circuit in the afternoon, Mitchell has to have talked to LaRue and said, pay the guy. We know that Mitchell and LaRue spoke. We know LaRue said, you know, what would you do? And Mitchell says, what's the money for? He says, legal fees. And Mitchell says, if it were me, I guess I'd pay them. So he's not paying him the 120000 It's not clear who called whom. LaRue thinks he called Mitchell. And most importantly to all of Watergate, it's not clear when that phone call occurred, whether it occurred in the morning or the afternoon. If it occurred in the morning, because John Dean tells him they need the money, he needs to call Mitchell. If it occurred in the morning, Nixon's out of the loop. If it occurred in the afternoon, you have a hypothetical case that Nixon may have been involved in the decision. Then we go to Thursday, Thursday at 2 o'clock. Everybody from the other meetings plus Mitchell, Nixon, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Dean, and Mitchell. This meeting on Thursday occurs in the old EOB, which has a terrible tape system. 
So you really can't hear half of what's going on. You're just straining like mad. But they have a conversation, and they talk about lots of stuff. And my view, there are other views, because the, the, the tapes are ambiguous, is at the Wednesday 5 o'clock meeting, they rejected John Dean's idea of granting some people immunity and just telling the Watergate story. We're not going to prosecute you, but we want to know what was going on, because Dean wants immunity. He knows what he's done. On the Thursday meeting... Are they, you sure of that? That Dean wants immunity? I'm positive Dean wants immunity. Uh, the, 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 whole, the whole conduct. I'm positive that Dean was running the cover-up and committing criminal acts. He says his supervisors knew it. I don't think so. Okay. That's the only part I'm, I, I can't prove. We, we know he met with Haldeman. We know he met with Ehrlichman. But there's no recording device. So he says, oh, they were in on it. They knew. I think he said, I'm having trouble containing the problem. But there was this concept, always the concept there within the staff of plausible deniability. You didn't tell the guy above you uh, information that would commit them to a criminal act. What might President Nixon have done after the famous cancer on the presidency conversation with Dean to have ended it? Well, I'll tell you what I think he did do, and I think it's on the tapes, but it's ambiguous. In this meeting on Thursday, roughly what they say is, we'll get John Dean to put in writing what he told you on Wednesday, that people have been, people have been perjuring themselves, there's been a cover-up, and we're being blackmailed. We'll get him to put that in writing. You will say, I've gotten this report from John Dean. It changes everything. And I'm calling for a renewed investigation, and I'm not going to claim executive privilege on behalf of my people. They're all going back to the grand jury to, to give evidence, because this stuff has come to my attention that is unacceptable. Okay? That's the decision. Now, that's quibbling about how much he puts in that report. They don't want to send their people to jail. Let's, you know, let, let's, uh, let's be vague. You've got to put it down, but don't. Don't, don't, don't be, don't be too specific. When does the president say, but that would be wrong? Uh, back in uh, 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 the Mar cancer on the presidency speech on Wednesday one morning. One on one with Dean. Well, Haldeman's there for part of the time. But what, is Haldeman there when he says, but that would be wrong? Well, I can't remember particularly when he says it. He says, we could do that, but it would be wrong. Haldeman later testifies, he's heard the tape. Nobody else has the tape, but he's heard the tape. And the president says that, and they convicted him of perjury because it comes later in the conversation. Excuse me, it comes later in the conversation. So you, you'd have to be very precise. It, it, the prosecutor says 10 times in that hour and a half meeting, Nixon said, I guess we better pay him to buy time to figure out what to do. But the, but the theme that comes out from it, I mean, you've got to look for it. These, these tapes are tough is the way to beat Hunt's threat of exposing seamy stuff he did for the White House, and he means the plumber's break-in. He means Ellsberg. He means Ellsberg, is to disclose that themselves. If they disclose that themselves, Hunt's got no threat to hold over them. The only question is how it comes out, how you start down that path because you'll lose control. If you start with another grand jury, or worse, if you go up to the Irvin Committee, it'll get politicized and there'll be a mess and people will be in real trouble. And some people have perjured themselves. And, 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 and so it, it's a question of how do we lance the boil and where do we start? So that decision is made at the Thursday meeting with Mitchell that we're going to get a report from John Dean. Now, John Dean has said there was no report and the idea of me going to Camp David to write the report comes up afterwards, but it's right there on the tape. John agrees to write a report, and they say, why don't you go to Camp David, you be uh, away from distractions, you can get this thing done, and we go to Friday, March 23rd, John Dean goes physically to Camp David to write the report. Judge Sirica's sentencing day, he sentences the burglars to up to 35 years in prison, and he releases what's called the McCord letter. Uh, James McCord had written Judge Sirica a letter that he delivered on Monday morning 
Sirica sat on it and then it displays it in court and it says uh, people have perjured themselves, there's been a cover-up. McCord didn't know anything more than that, but he put it in writing. The people who'd been running the cover-up knew. Magruder, who is, is uh, the, the, the guy still at Creep, who's really worried, and John Dean. And Magruder, who's not a strong guy to begin with, goes running around to see everybody else involved in the cover-up and says, I perjured myself in front of two grand juries. You have to lie to protect me. What did Magruder perjure himself about? Well, Hiring G. Gordon Liddy, knowing about the break-in, what is the cover-up that you just referred to? Uh, he didn't hire Gordon Liddy. John Dean hired Gordon Liddy. I, I got it, but what but did Magruder technically lie Magruder, about? Magruder was his boss. When the material from the May 28th break-in, which was successful, wasn't good enough, Magruder sent the team back in to fix the microphones. He's the one that gave the order to Liddy to go in. Hunt didn't want to go in. He said, this is crazy. This is high risk. There's nothing there. Low reward. Let's go bug the but suites they, in, that in Miami. That is the cover-up, is that Magruder knew, Magruder and Dean knew, and they worked together to make sure that the investigation did not get above Liddy. McCord and Liddy. Yes. That's the cover-up. Yes, that's the cover-up. The first cover-up. Protecting up. the first layer of protection is Magruder. It may or may not go up to Mitchell. We're vague on that part. But that's the first cover-up. The second cover-up begins thereafter. The one that in, ensnares President Nixon. Begins in this week of events that you're talking uh, about. There are allegations in the prosecutor's files. It's absolutely true. Uh, I don't see it this way. But they say Nixon learned, if not before, Nixon learned for sure on Wednesday, March 21st, from John Dean, and what he did after that cements him. He adopted the cover-up as its own. Is that and the smoking gun tape? No, no, no. The smoking gun tape is nine months before, six days after the break-in, where they say, we got to stop the FBI from interviewing two people. Uh, uh, and they say, and, and Dean says, let's get the CIA to tell the FBI. Oh, you're right. Okay. Bye. So, no, 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 but, but it's confusing because that conversation has, has been alleged to show Nixon was involved in the cover up from the beginning. But this is the critical week. But well, can we then go back to that conversation? The smoking gun, which is here at the library for anyone who wants to listen sure. to it, as is sure. the, uh, the the dean, cancer on the presidency. They're the two most significant tapes. Well, I Watergate. think I think there's four during this week, which are hugely significant, and there's one back in uh, back Tell on us June about 23rd. The June 23rd, 1972 tape. Okay, uh, uh, I, I got to set it up because the folks have been arrested on June 17th and it includes McCord, who is the head of security at Creep, and these Cubans. And, and the FBI has launched an investigation, and they put a lot of assets into it. And what, they've, what, what, what they want to do is trace those uncirculated, serially sequential $100 bills that were caught in the Cubans' possession. They've traced it to Miami. They've traced it to a bank account by Bernard Barker, who's one of the people who's been caught. And they found these travelers, uh, cashier's checks, signed by two people. And we would call them fundraisers or bundlers today. But they forwarded campaign contributions from other people, except they signed the cashier's checks. So the FBI wants to talk to them. And the trouble is that money, we didn't know this at the time. That money came from very, very prominent Democrats who were hedging their bets on the campaign, and they were contributing to both sides. And Maury Stans, the Senate finance, uh, the uh, creep finance chairman, has promised them their contribution will be confidential because it would ruin them if it became public. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh, John Dean has been over to see Pat Gray and the, and the FBI, and Gray says, there's all this foreign intrigue with these Cubans and this uh, international bank and this one set of cashier's checks signed by a Mexican lawyer. 
and we think it might be a CIA operation. So when he comes back to the White House and Maury Stan says, we, we got to stop the investigation of these people, uh, it's not they've traced the money to creep. They know that. What they want to do is find out how the money got to creep in the first place, and that we don't need them to find out. So John C Dean says to Haldeman, I've got an idea, and, and he credits Mitchell and says he agrees, but we can't show a conversation with Mitchell. Let's get the CIA to tell the FBI, these are our people, don't go interview them. Hold Is off the him. president in that meeting? Absolutely, there's a tape. It's Haldeman and Nixon on June 23rd. And, 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 and the, it's a strange tape. They're all strange tapes. He says, the investigation is going in a direction we don't want it to go. And, and Nixon says, what do you mean? He says, well, they're tracing the money. And, and he says, you mean they're after Maury Stans? Because, you know, Maury's head of finance. And he says, no, it's Ken Dahlberg. And Nixon says, who the hell is Ken Dahlberg? And he says, well, he's, 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 he moved the money into creep. He forwarded the money to creep. And there's some other guy, and they'll get his name later today, and that's David Manuel Ogario, this Mexican lawyer who's forwarded the money. And so they, they tell the CIA to tell the FBI not to interview these two they guys. They being who? They being Haldeman and Ehrlichman at the president's instruction. And do they call the CIA? No, they brought them over. They brought Helms and Vern Walters over, said, listen, this is going to get into the Bay of Pigs. You guys want to button this thing up. All you got to do is tell the FBI to stay away from these two guys. And in Pat Gray's book, he says, and the next day, John Dean calls me and says, you got the word, right? You got the word, don't interview those two people. And he says, yeah, I got the word. And then within 10, and then he calls Nixon and says, there's people that are interfering with the investigation. And that's where Nixon says, you go wherever you want. You're in charge of the investigation. But is and, and, and to a new listener, to a new listener, somebody yes. who doesn't know anything about it, okay. that June 1972 K tape, the smoking gun tape, shows Richard Nixon had knowledge of an effort to have the CIA stop an FBI investigation. Oh, he, he agreed. He agreed with that effort. Did he consider that criminal at the time? Would you no, say, was, among lawyers, that there was mens rea of a crime? No, the intent was to protect the, the disclosure of the names of two prominent uh, Democratic donors, there was no intent to interfere with the FBI investigation of Watergate. Now, of the, the break-in. Of the break-in. The other side will say any interference is per se criminal act, but you wouldn't impeach somebody for trying to protect the names of two Democratic donors. You just, you, you just wouldn't do that. And all it did was delay that interview, those two interviews, for 10 days. The CIA ultimately said it's not not our not on our watch. The the uh, FBI interviewed the career prosecutor said this has nothing to do with Watergate and life moved on. Then why, when it was revealed, was it so destructive of the president's will to remain in office? Well, because it was revealed uh, uh, on July twenty fourth, nineteen seventy four. Uh, the lawyers had never heard the tape before. Nixon had prevented them from hearing that tape. Uh, uh, when they heard it, this is Fred Bizart, and only Fred Bizart, he concluded incorrectly that Nixon had been on, in on the cover-up from the 23rd of June on. The cover-up of the break-in. The cover-up of the break-in. Uh, he had interfered with the FBI investigation to protect people from the FBI investigation, uh, that therefore he was involved from the very outset, that he had hidden this information from his lawyer, and that when this came out, and given the Supreme Court decision of that morning, it would certainly come out, and that the presidency was doomed. What was your interpretation of whether or not the president knew of the cover-up? prior to this week that we've been discussing? Well, we don't want to pick on me because I'm a kid. I'm 28 years old. My job working for Bazart is to provide as accurate a transcript of the tapes as is possible to run the document room holding the seized files in accordance with the rules, rules promulgated that 
the people cannot take lawyers into the room, that they cannot bring papers out of the room, that a Secret Service agent and I must be physically present in the room at all times. That's what I'm doing. I am not sitting there so I'm, I'm, I'm telling a judgment. story, though. I know, but but looking back, first of all, very quickly, very quickly, when did you join the legal defense team moving from the Domestic Policy Council? What day or month? Uh, November of, uh, October or November of uh, uh, 1973. Uh, uh, and I never legally joined. I was going to be named deputy counsel, and Fred said at one point, you know, Jeff, the way things are going, it would be better if you stayed as associate director of the domestic council and you just devoted all your time and effort to me. So you became part of the defense Absolutely. team without... So um, as a young lawyer at the time, when you read that transcript as best you could or listened to the tape as best you could, did you at the time believe that President Nixon knew about the Watergate break-in or did you instantly understand it was a discrete set of circumstances and issues about which he was directing the CIA to talk to the FBI? Uh, we have to clarify. Fred heard the tape. Fred relayed his view of the tape by phone to San Clemente, to Nixon and to Haig. Fred then instructed, and I heard that, half of that conversation, heard Fred's half. Fred then instructed me to listen to the tape and to pre prepare the transcript. So I'm the third person to hear the smoking gun tape. I prepared the only transcript. I'm the one that called it the smoking gun, but only because Fred said it, it, it was going to end the presidency. It, at no point did I make a decision on what it meant. I was keying off Fred's conclusion that it was the end. Uh, and my, my role was to provide as accurate a transcript as could be had. Uh, it, Throughout this, I'm an unswerving, unquestioning believer in Richard Nixon and what he's trying to accomplish as president. Did you think he had been involved in June 1972 in a cover-up of the burglary, having read and listened to the tape in uh, 1974? That's, that's, uh, that's an indistinguishable thought. Uh, uh, what I thought the day before this tape the day before the Supreme Court decision was we were gearing up for a fight over what the president did after March 21st when John Dean came in and told him what had happened. This tape appears out of nowhere, which Nixon has kept hidden from us. Uh, uh, Fred, my boss, who has devoted unceasing hours to Nixon's defense, has informed me this is it. This is unambiguous. This is an obstruction of justice. All is lost. All right, now tell me a little bit about the president and the tapes. Um, did he listen to them himself? Did Rose listen to them? Where, what was it, Rose Woods? What was his relationship with the tapes once they came to light? Uh, I would like to go back just, just for my... Someday uh, you'll answer a question just I, to help I, out I, the narrative. I'll go back to Friday. I really do. Let me just okay. finish up. Friday then we're, so we we'll do part five okay. on the tapes. Dean, Dean goes to Camp David to write the report. He realizes he can't write that report without incriminating himself because he's been running the cover-up. So he retains criminal defense counsel. It was a prominent Democrat. And they approach the career prosecutors looking for immunity. And the career prosecutors meet with them uh, uh, a number of times uh, uh, over the month of April. This is, remember, this is the end of March over the month of April, and the career prosecutors, and we have their notes from all these meetings, and they conclude they're not going to give him immunity. He's too intimately involved in the cover-up. Of the break-in. Yeah, cover-up of the break-in. So Dean and his lawyer approach the Irvin Committee that's looking for witnesses and drama, and they say, we will give you immunity. Okay, because we, 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 at this point, the... Congress has the right to give a certain sort of immunity. They'll give Dean immunity in exchange for his testimony. They have a vested interest in making him their hero. So the American public sees John Dean presented as this whistleblowing hero instead of the guy who ran the cover-up and then when it blew up switched sides 
and changed his testimony to blame his higher ups. Now let's go to the, or do you want to? Uh, now I would, um, in fact, I think it would be a good time to move to the next segment, but I want to wrap up discreetly. You left me hanging on one second. I apologize. Before. We'll come back to the tapes and the president in a second. But when John Dean went to Camp David, yes. he makes a decision to turn. Yeah, absolutely. Does he leave Camp David? Yes, he tells Haldeman he can't do the report. Haldeman says, you may as well come home. He comes home, and on March 28th, he retains Charles Schaffer as his criminal defense counsel. And that's when he turns. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's and, when he turns. And very quickly, Jeff Shepard, when that lawyer contacts the career prosecutors, yes. what's the reaction of the career prosecutors? A great surprise. Absolute great surprise. They knew and worked with John Dean. John Dean had been at the Department of Justice. They're very surprised, and it, it is very, very clear from all of the notes that Schaffer comes in and says, John Dean can finger John Mitchell and Jeb Magruder about knowing about the break-in in advance. He's your path to those two people. On that note, we will end part five and pick up with what happens next in the president and the tapes in part six of Known Unknowns, Watergate. Thank you. <laughs>